So I chose to call uh, this presentation Disentangling the Mess, the Life and Times of Video Game Addiction and Loot Boxes, um, which are two of the things that I've been looking into. Um, video game addiction is my primary area of research and loot boxes is something that I kind of felt I had to get into uh, back in 2018 when, um, when big debates erupted around loot boxes. Um, but, um, yep, this is me, um, and this is what I look like when I receive an award. That's the very, uh, smug, smi self-satisfied smile you see on my face. Um, my background is in psychology. I have a, an MA or an MSc in, um, in psychology from the University of Copenhagen. Um, and then I went on to the IT University of Copenhagen where I did, um, a master's degree in games. And then I sort of straddled these two areas and, uh, and, and did a PhD um, in, in game studies, but you know, very heavily based uh, in psychology, where I took a look at uh, video game addiction, um, which at that time didn't have an official name or uh, diagnosis. Um, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, I'm really excited. I'm really excited to reach out to uh, my international colleagues as well. Um, so Germany and Denmark are, of course, two countries that we perceive of as being similar on on very many points. But um, there is there are large cultural differences between how uh, games and concerns about games are expressed in, uh, in, in Denmark and, and Germany. And for those of you who are interested in that, I can recommend the work of uh, Estel Sørensen and, um, and this book where I have, I have one chapter in this, in this uh, anthology. Um, and it kind of deals about how concerns about video games express themselves in different cultures. Um, yeah. And this is what I look like when I play Pokemon Go. Um, oh, my slides aren't really working. Okay, so there is supposed to be a subheading uh, saying uh, research interests. So as Gerald said, I'm very much interested in video game addiction, uh, specifically about critiquing it. Um, then I did a little bit of work in the area of violent games. Um, and uh, and how they're perceived and how their effects are perceived. Then I've done some work on on esports, uh, interviewing uh, esports players in Denmark about what it takes to be a good esports player, and you know what skills you you actually are improving when you try to improve as a player. Then I did some some stuff on media effects more broadly, uh, some stuff on whether or not. Uh, smoking in in movies uh, might have an effect, or a very American research question: uh, Does sex in movies, you know, correlate with the uh, sexual pe young people's sexual behavior? Um, and then more recently, looking into skins in digital games and how they function as money uh, on casino sites. So that's that's kind of what I what I'm most interested in. Oh, those are my areas of research. Um, so you can find all that stuff uh, on my university page. We really uh, try to make everything uh, available. Uh, so we try not to hide stuff behind paywalls. So if you navigate to this site, uh, you can find my research here. And if you want to get in, in touch, you can send me an email um, on this email address. All right. Um, so one study that we did um, was looking at, at eSports. Um, and and for, for me, as someone who looks primarily at all of the things that parents are worried about uh, when it comes to video games, it was interesting to, to get a, a view into what esports players in an esports program at a, a local school in Denmark or a sports college connected to a school in Denmark, uh, what, what esports players felt that they were doing. And, um, 
and they interestingly enough said that you know communication skills um, and teamwork skills or people skills are the very are the the most important skills when it comes to esports so these are counter strike players um, and they rank people skills above you know, an understanding of the game or the hand-eye coordination and dexterity and quick reflexes that, that goes into playing the game. Um, and, and they at least felt that, um, that these communication skills also translated into making them better students in school, better, um, you know, group mates in, in group pro projects in school. Um, and they talk very much about having a healthy game culture and for them, that that meant that meant taking care of yourself, getting enough sleep, getting enough exercise, um, taking care of your teammates, making sure that you pick them up if they're down. Um, and they also talked about esports as something that relates to growth and development. Um, so they actually felt that their coach was invested in them and their growth as human beings first and foremost, and then also as, as esports players. So I think some of this research will, you know, at least for some people be surprising, but uh, also for some parents be very um, comforting to know that at least their kids are experiencing uh, all of these um, positive consequences or benefits of, of playing uh, video games and doing esports. Um, Interestingly enough, though, it also seems that that the game is not the important part. The game is just the medium where all of this takes place. It could just have easily has, has had been something else. Um, yes, um, then I did some work about uh, on um, or writing about um, policy, policy interventions that are enacted uh, around the world to try to curb uh, video game addiction or to help kids play less. Um, and basically our main point in this paper is that it's way too early to start to do something about video game addiction um, or gaming disorder as it's called in um, by the World Health Organization. Um, because right now it seems that it's, um, that it might be a symptom of something underlying that's wrong rather than being a mental illness in and of itself. Um, uh, yes, loot boxes. Um, so I'll get more into loot boxes in depth later on. Uh, but we basically say that we can't call it loot boxes. We need to call it something else, like random reward mechanisms. And we can't ask our loot boxes in general gambling. We need to ask specific questions about specific types of loot boxes or features that loot boxes have. Um, and then my latest um, my latest article um, is with Animated Torhauge from University of Copenhagen. And we were basically wondering why it is that Valve, the company that owns the platform Steam, allows skins, you know, um, I'm not sure people know what skins are, for, for those that don't, skins are these cosmetic items in video games. Um, and because Steam allows the skins to travel beyond the game and beyond their own platform, then skins become money and they can be used in, um, in skin bedding uh, websites, which are basically like casinos, but because they're illegal, they allow anyone in there. So a lot of kids in Denmark, at least, are going on these skin bedding sites and are bedding skins that are worth uh, a lot of money. Um, and we basically try to dig into how is it that this happens? And, and we were basically motivated by the question of why would Valve allow this? Um, they're making a lot of money being uh, a platform that uh, that you know hosts other other creators uh, games and then they just take a cut and so as that middleman that just kind of takes a cut they they have a, um, a high margin of um, profit 
because they they don't need to to do uh, that much work um, because they are in this middleman situation, kind of like Amazon is um, or the um, the App Store um, that's on um, on iPhones. So we kind of looked, we tried to look at Epic and Steam to see two different versions of platforms and, and what kind of drives there are in these platforms and these economies. Okay, so I call this, I, I, the, the title of this talk, talk indicates that I think that there's a lot of mess, there's a huge mess going on in specifically in video game addiction research, but to a lesser degree also in our discussions of loot boxes. Um, and I think one of the reasons is that we don't really know what we're talking about when we talk about video game addiction. Um, yes, but loot boxes first. Um, I'm assuming that most of you know what loot boxes are. They are in video games. They are often packs with that contain digital cards inside that you can open. Some of them are only cosmetic. Uh, some actually have a function in the game. Um, we also know them from the real world or meat space, um, where we have these, uh, baseball cards or football cards or kinder surprise or, uh, these machines with, with toys inside, um, basically things where you, you pay, uh, an amount of money and then you get some kind of reward. You don't know what it is. Uh, it might be what you want. It, it might also, and most likely is, something that you don't want. Um, and loot boxes became a, a big deal in in video game culture, but also in the culture at large. I was invited on to some of the biggest news shows in Denmark to talk about loot boxes back in 2018, uh, because players were rebelling against um, the most recent Star Wars game, Star Wars Battlefront 2. Um, yeah, so we believe that we can't talk about loot boxes. We need to talk about random reward mechanisms because, uh, if you, if you, if you want to do, if you want to make rules about loot boxes, then you can easily turn the box into a crate or a pinata or a barrel or something else. And you can call what's inside it something else than loot. Loot. So we, we tried to come up with a more um, academic term and we chose random reward mechanisms. Um, and then we tried to look at what, how are these structured? And, it, and it's usually so that there's an eligibility con condition, like something needs to happen. Then there's like a random procedure or pseudo random because it's, it's an algorithm, right? So it's not truly random. And then you get some kind of reward. And in terms of gambling, uh, it's of course really interesting to see how this relates to real money or fiat currency, the money that we use in stores. Um, and if we add that layer to this model, we can see that the eligibility condition can either be embedded in the economy or it can be isolated from it. So it can either be so that you can pay money to get a loot box or open it, um, or there might be like a hard barrier so that that you can't, you know, use money to, to purchase the loot box. Then something random happens, then you get a reward. And in some games, that reward is isolated from the real economy. It's like inside the game only, or on some platforms like Steam, it's relatively easy to uh, convert your reward into uh, fiat currency or real money. So that's the that's how we basically look at it, um, and that leaves that makes us have these four different types of loot boxes, um, where type one, um, it's impossible to pay money into the game to open a, 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 a to get a random reward, and it's also impossible to extract money from that reward. And games that have these things, you could go back as far as Super Mario. Uh, where you sometimes get random rewards when you open chests or more modern games like Borderlands 3 or going back to the Diablo games. Um, 
Horizon Zero Dawn is a single player game that also has loot boxes, but where money doesn't really play a role. And in our model, we term those games like 100% game. Then we have a more rare category where you're not able to put money into the system to trigger a random reward, but the re you only you have to play to, to get it. Um, but the reward you get, you can sell, or at least you could, when Diablo 3 had an, still had an auction house. And we label that work because it seems more like work than it seems like, like gambling, even though there is an, an element of randomness in this situation, right? Then we come to uh, type three, um, where you are able to purchase uh, packs with cards um, or trigger uh, random rewards, uh, but the reward you get is isolated. It stays in the game. Uh, this, of course, is not black and white. Um, in some games, there's a black market and players trade even though it's illegal, but this is our category for all of these games where it's where it's difficult or impossible to extract money. And the games that the game that caused the big controversy falls into that category. Um, and um, we call this half gambling or pseudo gambling um, because a game like Star Wars Battlefront 2, uh, there's no internal market in the game where you can trade and, and, and buy this stuff. Um, and so you can't you can't influence this with a black market with real currency um, from from the real world. Um, so that would be type three, and um, and though and Star Wars Battlefront two was of course the game that caused the big controversy. Um, then we have uh, type four, um, and these are games where you actually spend money in order to to trigger a random reward mechanism and then you get some kind of token some kind of thing and that's something that you can easily sell as well um, and we think that's just straight up gambling so just like you go into a casino and you use real money to purchase tokens then you go and gamble you might win tokens then you exchange those for for fiat currency and then you leave that's gambling um, and we argue that that some games um, function in this way because it's so easy to sell uh, the rewards you get. So in this model, it's pretty clear that type four is gambling, but uh, that type three is something that we really don't usually consider gambling um, because of course we also have collectible card games outside of digital games um, and we don't consider baseball card or the courts at least uh, and most people don't consider baseball cards as gambling, buying baseball cards, even though you can purchase one pack extremely cheaply and you might log out and have a extremely valuable card that you can then sell on eBay, right? Um, so a lot of the games in, in, in our model type three um, are considered gambling by players and, and also by courts. So in Holland and Belgium, for example, here in the EU, um, FIFA Ultimate Team is considered a gambling game and therefore it's, it's illegal for, um, for minors to play that game. Um, in Denmark, uh, it's not. Uh, and that's also how it is in, in most of the European countries uh, because the gambling authorities in those countries um, believe that uh, at least in Denmark, they believe that it's not gambling because it's illegal to sell the cards or the account uh, that you have the cards in. Um, then, of course, we have uh, we have games like so a game like Borderlands Lens 3 that, according to to our model, doesn't have gambling in it. Uh, pokes fun, I think, of other games that have loot boxes by having uh, one-armed bandits or slot machines that are called loot boxer, where where players can gamble inside the game. Uh, but again, because the game economy is separate from the real world economy in our model, we don't consider this to be gambling. Um, and I think if if parents were able to 
to determine the value of cards in in a game like FIFA, they would they would think that um, that that FIFA packs uh, are not like Easter eggs or Kinder eggs, Kinder surprise, um, which is an argument that EA made, right? That that their card packs are just like Kinder surprise. Uh, you get a toy, you don't know what it is, um, but using some using data from another scientist who actually opened up a lot of uh, of these uh, packs. I made like a rough estimate of what uh, the most expensive player in, I believe this was FIFA 18 maybe, um, where the, the most expensive player at some, at some point um, would carry a, a price tag of more than 2000 euros um, so of course you might just pay one euro and open one pack and get him, but uh, according to the probabilities uh, and the values of the in the internal market of the game, you should expect to pay uh, more than two thousand euros to to get this card. Um, and so this is what I think one of the really interesting cases because, on the one hand, I don't believe that it's completely gambling because you never fall into this idea that if you lost the the rent money for next month that you could go and get an illegal loan gamble again and win back the money that you that you lost that's the trap that a lot of game pathological gamblers fall into right if you have gambling addiction you generally believe that all your problems can be solved by by more gambling right um and that wouldn't be it's hard to imagine that that could be the case in a game where um, the money you spend inside the game stay there forever. Um, but it's an it's 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 an interesting case because it seems, at least to me, to be manipulative because you don't know, uh, or at least I didn't have the, um, I wasn't able to imagine that one player would be so expensive. Um, and I think that's also why uh, professional FIFA players spend so much money on on these card packs, right? It's because they need, in that game, it's not just cosmetic. They actually need the, the great players in order to, to play well. Uh, so for someone uh, like me and Gerald, who are almost the same skill level in FIFA, um, the one having the better the better squad would, would, would be the one who would be most likely to win, I believe. Um, because these stats that the the players have actually do make a different in, difference inside the game. Um, and the million dollar question, of course, is that is now do loot boxes cause gambling problems and gambling addiction? Uh, that's what a lot of people are, are scared that if you introduce this milder form of gambling to kids, then they might grow up and end up having uh, severe gambling problems. Um, we don't really have the data to support that yet, um, but there is, of course, uh, a correlation. So studies have found that people who like to gamble also like to open loot boxes um, on on average, right? Not not everyone, but there's a, there's there's a trend in that direction. Um, and of course, we can't know if people like gambling because they like loot boxes or the other way around, or if it's something third, right? If there's just a type of person that is that is drawn or vulnerable to these kind of mechanics, uh, that then end up, you know, uh, spending money on these things and developing serious problems. Um, so I think we will be taking questions at the end. So um, please uh, write down any questions or comments that you have to uh, to our model. Um, we were hoping when we published that article that other people would r run with it and build on it and add to it, uh, but that really hasn't happened. So uh, for anyone out there looking to do a project, um, I think this is an area that's that needs more research um, and more discussions. And our model, of course, doesn't take into account um, the differences between um, random rewards that are only cosmetic or random rewards that uh, have an effect inside the game.
So my main area of research is um, the concept of video game addiction. And um, just to draw uh, out some highlights of some of that research, um, I do I do believe that it's it's premature to call it an addiction. So people do report having problems with video games, um, but we also know that video games often can function as a coping me mechanism for other problems. So if we all, you know, have to handle our lives and cope with our problems, and for a lot of people, um, video games is a great way to cope with loneliness, uh, social anxiety, tons of stuff. Um, and, but we don't, really don't know if it's, if it's mostly a positive coping mechanism or if it's a negative one. And some researchers believe that video games have this negative pull that if you use them as a coping mechanism, then, you know, uh, you're starting a downward spiral and it will, everything will get worse. Um, I tend to believe that it's mostly a positive one. Uh, but of course, that that some people will need help um, if they are too focused on video games to cultivate other areas of their life um, and find other interests. Um, we don't know how stable the disorder is. It seems that it's something that you kind of can drift into and out of. So unlike, for example, being addicted to nicotine um, and having to smoke uh, and, and wanting to quit and not being able to, uh, which is relatively stable, uh, it seems that video game addiction is is not at all stable. Also, it seems to be an area where there's not an environment. Um, and one of the, the criteria for something being uh, a disorder in psychological terms and psychiatric terms is that it needs to lead to clinical impairment. Uh, so it needs to be the game that's hindering you in doing the stuff that's important in your life um, and not just the game being what you do while you're not doing what you're supposed to do right so kids that are not going to school for example are they not going to school because they play video games or are they just playing video games whenever they don't go to school um, we still need a lot more research on 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 that side of it um, and so we also, uh, me and my co-authors in, in this particular um, article, fear that uh, the consequences um, of the negative consequences of labeling digital games as something that causes addiction and is the basis of disorder might be far greater than what whatever negative influence video games might have. So the fact that what you do and love is labeled as something that's pathological or is, or sick or unhealthy. Um, we fear that that, that might be even uh, worse than, than, than what, what, what any game could do, no matter how, how much the designers of the game design it against the players instead of for the players. Um, so, um, I don't have time to dig into all of my research, but something that I can dig into is how uh, game addiction uh, came to be known as internet gaming disorder in, in, in the handbooks that psychiatrists work with. So, based on this paper, kind of looks into that. Um, and so, the, the interesting uh, thing that's going that the state of affairs right now is that in the United States of America, uh, you can't be a video game addict because it's not recognized as a disorder. So at least you shouldn't be able to go to a doctor and then get that diagnosis, right? Because it's not in the handbook, the manual that lists all of the disorders that you can suffer from. In Europe, on the other hand, and the rest of the world, we follow the World Health Organization and their manual uh, that's called the International Classification of Diseases. Um, and the 11th edition is coming out soon. And in that uh, edition, it will be possible to be addicted to uh, to video games. They don't use the word addiction in the description, but it's in the heading. So it's under addictive behaviors and it's with in the same category as nicotine, alcohol, and so forth. Um, but 
along with gambling, it's the only uh, behavior that you can be addicted to that doesn't involve a substance. Then in the East, uh, including China, uh, video game addiction is already classified as a mental health disorder and it is seen as the biggest uh, health threat to the population, um, as, at least as, as far as I'm informed. Of course, it, it gets dicey and difficult uh, to get a, an idea about uh, the state of affairs uh, in China when you don't speak the language and have to rely on other people. Yes. Um, so in 2013, um, the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, published uh, this volume, the handbook, uh, and they uh, they omitted um, what they call internet gaming disorder, and instead they put it in the back of the manual. So they they kind of wrote out what a what a like what a this disorder might look like, but they wrote that there's we don't have enough evidence to support um, that we include it in the manual. So it's in there, but it's in the back as something that we can look into, along with other things such as caffeine addiction. Um, but what is it that we're actually talking about when we talk about addiction? Um, so in medical terms, addictions are only negative, right? There's no such thing as, as a positive addiction. And in medical terminology, it's a primary disease meaning that it's not just a symptom of something else, it is the main disease, it's a chronic disease, and it's, it's related to dysfunction in the, in, the, in the brain, and that causes you know, these psychological, social, biological um, uh, symptoms that we see. Um, but historically, uh, the word addiction uh, comes from Latin, and it wasn't all bad, it's simply meant to give some to give oneself over to something, and that might be positive. So a senator who was addicted to the Senate was like, you know, that was something to aspire for. That was, uh, you know, highly valued. But then, of course, if you're, if you're addicted to another person because you're a slave, then, of course, that's bad. So historically, it's had these two connotations, both positive and negative. Um, and in, in modern Western medicine, it's still highly controversial, this whole debate, whether or not you can actually be addicted to a behavior uh, in the same way that you can be addicted to cocaine or heroin or something like that. Um, and as I said, in the, in the World Health Organization's ICD-11, um, there are still no categories for work addiction, shopping addiction, food addiction, sex addiction, internet addiction, phone addiction, any of these addictions that we talk about um, in colloquial speech or in everyday life, um, those aren't medical terms because they are not uh, in that um, handbook. So it's, it's only gambling for money and playing video games. Um, and, and that's kind of my point of departure in this whole critique, um, because as I see it, we have exactly the same kind of evidence that exercise is addictive that we do uh, with video games. But for some reason um, that I can't figure out, it's, it's only video games that's officially classified under uh, the headline of addictions. Um, and 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 the roots, I believe, of uh, a lot of this research that uh, this uh, diagnosis builds upon are exactly research that see, that defines addiction as something that's either positive, negative, or somewhere in between. Um, so RIF Brown in 1991 wrote that um, addiction is a value-free concept. Um, the fact that you know about some someone that you're an addict doesn't tell you much because you don't know if it's bad or good or whatever it is. Um, and he actually wrote that that gaming and simulation might be a mixed blessing addiction. Um, but nevertheless, um, this is the framework. So as you see on 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 this model, I kind of trace the the roots of um, how internet gaming disorder became proposed as a mental health disorder by the American 
Psychiatric Association and DSM-5. So a lot of the, the research that, that the work group based their de um, definition on actually directly uh, cites Brown and, 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 and this notion that you can be addicted to anything and it can be positive or, or negative. So it, it kind of moves without there being critical reflection about what it means to put it into a medical uh, medical terminology, um, and then it moves into the the, um, the handbook. That's why I tried to to show on this model how it starts out being value free, then becomes something that's sick or pathological, uh, and then moves into the the handbook. Um, so. Of course, you don't propose a new disorder without having read a lot of research. Um, but and and some of the most uh, influential research actually comes from from China and specifically from one one uh, paper by Tao and colleagues from 2010. And it's interesting when when you look that up, uh, they write in their paper um, where they outline. Um, they, so they don't outline game addiction specifically, they outline internet addiction, and then they say that can be like communication, messaging, so forth. It can be searching for porn, looking at porn, and then it could be game addiction. That's the that's the framework that Tao and colleagues are proposing. Um, but for some reason that uh, is not very well explained, uh, the APA only takes this one small sub compartment of game addiction and and puts it into um, to their their handbook. So uh, the Chinese study, uh, Tao and colleagues, they write that New York psychiatrist Ivan Goldberg first proposed in 1995 that internet addiction may be considered a disorder. And so I tried to uh, to track down Ivan Goldberg, and it turns out that Ivan. Dr. Ivan had a very dry sense of humor. And so uh, in, in one telling um, by William Van Oram, um, he says that in 1995, Dr. Ivan made an off the cuff comment about the growing problems of internet addiction. Those who heard about this did not realize Dr. Ivan's wonderfully dry and ironic sense of humor. Soon the psychiatric field and media were abuzz with this new phenomenon. When asked about whether there could be support groups for this addiction, Dr. Ivan suggested that support groups for internet addiction made about as much sense as support groups for coughing. And he says um, in, an, in another place that to medicalize every behavior by putting it into psychiatric nomenclature, meaning terms or wording, is ridiculous. If you expand the concept to addiction to include everything people can overdo, then you must talk about people being addicted to books. Um, so Dr. Goldberg actually proposed internet addiction as a joke uh, because he felt that the handbook of mental disorders were growing disproportionately uh, because for every addiction, more diseases are added. And he felt that, you know, the area of normalcy was kind of shrinking. It was it's more and it's more and more difficult to be normal or not sick, uh, because so many new diseases are being discovered all the time. And so it's kind of ironic um, that um, that this joke ends up in a in a paper in China and then ends up actually being the foundation of a new uh, disorder in this handbook that Dr. Goldberg was critiquing to begin with. Um, so of course, just because it started as a joke doesn't mean that it's not real, but it's 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 really interesting nonetheless to see how um, how uh, diagnoses can travel from one culture to another and travel back and end up doing the exact same thing, uh, the exact opposite of what it was intended to do. Um, of course, not everyone. Uh, thought it was a joke. Uh, Kimberly Young uh, was one, someone who took it um, uh, seriously, and she wondered if criteria for pathological gambling um, could lead to the discovery of pathological internet use. So what she did was she took the criteria of gambling addiction and then swapped out uh, the word gambling with using the internet 
and posted it on on Usenet groups and got a lot of responses from people who then scored as addicts according to these questionnaires. Um, I believe uh, that it's that that's kind of dangerous because there's with heroin, cocaine, gambling, there are inherent negative consequences that we just don't see in everyday things like using the internet or exercising or playing video games and stuff like that. Um, so while on the one hand, it might be uh, really problematic to be thinking about heroin um, when you're supposed to be studying, uh, it might not be as problematic to think about video games. Though, of course, uh, for some people, uh, it might be. Um, the question then, of course, becomes, you know, what's really going on? Is, is it about the games or is it about something else? Yes. Um, so we see here how um, criteria for a gambling disorder actually starts out um, as inspiration for Jung, who is then picked up by this um, Chinese um, uh, research group and then it forms the basis of uh, internet gaming disorder in DSM-5. So it actually comes from DSM. Uh, just a previous version already. And so if we uh, combine these two charts, we end up with a mess like this that kind of shows the ways that, uh, or the influences on this new proposed disorder, uh, internet gaming disorder, or in everyday speak, uh, game addiction. Um, so it traveled back and forth. And the question is, what got lost in translation, if everything, if anything? Well, according to An Andrew Shabilsky from the Oxford, Oxford Internet uh, Institute, um, this whole thing is an epistemic dumpster fire. Um, so he's someone who's done research in this space and and thinks that the epistemology of a lot of this research is is a complete mess. Um, and I tend to to agree, even though I am not uh, nearly creative enough to come up with a phrase like this whole thing is an epistemic dumpster fire. Um, yeah, so, oh, where did my presentation go? There we are. Um, so Shubilsky has done uh, research that, uh, you know, uh, funnily enough, support his claims. Um, so this piece of research that he did is not specifically about technology, is not about um, video games, but about technology use and well-being. And and in this paper, he and Amy Orban find that the association between digital technology use and adolescent well-being is negative meaning there is a, a negative correlation, meaning that the more time you spend on technologies, the, the worse you feel. But it's so tiny that it explains at most 0.4% of the variation in well-being. So this is next to nothing. Um, and they write that the association of well-being with regularly eating potatoes was nearly as negative as the association with technology use and wearing glasses was more negatively associated with well-being. Um, so of course, this is correlation. Uh, so we don't know if people who feel a little bit worse play a little bit more video games um, or whatever is going on. Um, so we don't. This doesn't prove causality, but it does kind of hint at the fact that um, technology use does not uh, explain. Um, variation in well-being um, as much as, you know, uh, bullying, for example, or stress or whatever we, you know, we we encounter in, in our lives. So if you want to make someone feel better than um, preventing them from playing video games uh, does not appear to be a viable solution. Uh, another recent study uh, found that uh, um, <clears throat> so 
the authors of this uh, systematic review of video game addiction um, find that that there simply isn't uh, quality research out there. Um, the findings suggest that the way systematic reviews of gaming disorder have been reporting results and drawing conclusions may have introduced bias into the gaming disorder literature, possibly misleading future research, policy making, and patient care. Um, so I guess what um, what my research uh, indicates and what some other research indicates is that while we have a ton of research that says that internet gaming disorder or game addiction is real, um, we also have uh, a lot of indications that the the research that, that these opinions are based on just isn't of a high enough quality. Um, so based on this, um, it does seem that that video game addiction um, is uh, is not solely a negative, right? It was if it was only negative, and, it, and if it was an inherent effect in the game itself, then we would see um, a lot more negative outcomes that we just don't see. Um, so my final point before wrapping up. Um, so we, of course, when when the World Health Organization proposed that video game addiction should be accepted as a mental disorder, uh, we emailed um, two of the officials, and um, and they. So after uh, a, a many emails from Dr. Ferguson, uh, he finally got a reply back, uh, saying. You know, basically, please stop emailing us. We 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 got your emails, um, but we are. But the officials reported receiving enormous pressure to include video gaming as an addiction disorder, particularly from Asian countries, and that, quotes, we have, a strong request from our stakeholders to take into consideration the health aspects. So. It seems that. Um, to me, at least, it seems that that um, that that this is an example of the World Health Organization, on the one hand, being you know the pinnacle of knowledge about uh, health and disease, but also being a political organization that kind of has to cater to to large countries such as China and the U.S. Because if China and the U.S. leave the World Health Organization. This, of course, will will greatly cripple that organization's able uh, ability to um, to function, right? Um, so, so I think this kind of indicates that there are other interests at stake besides the purely um, purely research ones. I mean, uh, a generous. Um, um, reading of this uh, might, of course, of course, be that we are under uh, enormous pressure by all of the evidence coming from from Asian countries, and that might be what what they're talking about. But the way I read it, because I don't think we have the the research evidence, is that that pressure is something different than strictly uh, academic and scientific research. Um, yeah. So. Um, I guess that kind of uh, wraps up my 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 presentation. Um, I was deeply inspired to do this research by by headlines such as this, saying that playing games are as addictive as heroin. Um, but for now, I am far for far from convinced. That wraps up my um, my presentation, and. Um, I don't know if it's if it's time for a short break before questions or. Well, thank you very much for your presentation to begin with. Very, very interesting, very, very in depth, going into a lot of details. I don't know, Micha, should we continue with the questions? Should we take a short break? No, I think we should we should continue with the questions. Okay. Okay. Well, very I... nice talk. Thank you, Rune. Thank you very much. Okay. Very interesting. I've noted down quite a lot of things I want to ask, but maybe let's first ask the students and the people. 
here in the crowd, whether there are some questions. Yes, Judith, go ahead. Uh, I'm just going to start. Thank you very much for all those uh, insights. Um, as somebody who, um, yeah, I guess played a lot of online games and also met lots of people playing these games, having depression and anxiety and these kind of things and seeing them as obviously some kind of coping mechanism that also helped them though mm. to evolve over the time. I'm kind of interested if that whole discussion about is it an addiction or is it not one or how far does it go? Does that also include how um, how it can actually help people evolve, like get away from their other problems or like um, figure out a way to, um, yeah, not only like hide from their problems, yeah. but like deal with them in a better way. Um, so I think um, it, it's, it seems to me that calling this an addiction um, is dangerous primarily because we know how to treat addictions, right? Or at least we think we do. We think you just need to be cut off from the substance and then do stop doing, you know, take a cold turkey and stop doing whatever drug you're doing, right? But but a, a, as as you also talk about, a lot of people who are struggling with anxiety or depression do turn to video games, and I think in in that case, it would be catastrophic to to cut them to cut cut them out of the game world because, um, as as Miguel Sigard once joked, uh, World of Warcraft is basically Facebook with orcs. So for a lot of people, it is a social media and a way to engage with their friends. Um, and if it is true that the addiction doesn't spring from the object, but is um, um, a symptom of something else, then I think uh, psychiat psychologists would uh, would be well advised to treat it not as an addiction, but as one domain where they know how to function and then kind of see how can we expand that domain? How can we make it so that you can also attend school? How can we make it so that you can use what you know how to do in games into the workplace or or wherever and i think that's why it's diff it's dangerous to call it uh, an addiction it's because it kind of it influences the way we treat it right in china there are these horror stories of these camps where kids are sent where they get electroshock therapy and medication and stuff like that in order to stop uh, being addicted to video games and according to some newspapers, people have even died in, in these camps because they they get uh, punished physically. Um, and I think that just shows the, the worst extreme of how we might go wrong. Um, and I think a psychologist working with people who experience pro problems with playing too much would do well to uh, to view games as on par as everything else, right? What would you do with someone who works too much or exercises too much or does something else too much and see it not as uh, a drug addiction but something else thank you i hope that was uh, an answer to the question that you were posing thank you anybody else sam uh yeah first of all thanks a lot for the amazing presentation uh, actually, I want to go briefly to the the anatomy of the loot boxes that mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned. That as as the mm -hmm. I I saw this I saw this pattern while coming down in this table, that as soon as the genres of the games are more to be to be saying like uh, connecting with the reality. For example, FIFA is a kind of game in which they make the statistics or the avatars of real players from real life. And an MMORPG is such a game in which you have to, like, uh, connect with people from online sources and communications. On the other hand, for example, Horizon Zero Dawn, which was labeled on the first top, is a AAA game which is highly fantasized and it mm -hmm. has its own world. And if you are not interacting with this world and not learning the communications of the world, you will not be able to play the game. So mm -hmm. do you think that the the more the games are becoming realistic, for example, let's say virtual reality, argumented reality, and the loot boxes are coming in these games, the 
the more dangerous will be will it be for some of the parties let's say the people who make money from loot boxes easily mm -hmm. uh, like reachable for them yeah so i i think uh something that we don't talk about in the paper but that would be really interesting if other people worked on is exactly um the question of what does it mean that I invest my own identity into the the avatar or or whatever's going on in the game, right? Um, because at least I don't know how it it worked where where you guys were when you guys were growing up, but when I was a kid in 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 school, there were certain brand names that you were supposed to have, and I never had the right brands. I never had the the right brand for my backpack or for the shoes that were fashionable for like one year, and I think. So we see this play out in the real world all the time, right? Um, that um, the more invested people are in 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 acquiring all of these uh, social status symbols, um, I guess the 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 more willing they might be to take risks and and do stuff, right? I mean, kids trying to steal the stuff that they can't afford. Um, so I do think that there is something about whenever they experience. The more real life or you in, invest your real life identity in the game, there might be something there um, because you are more invested in these uh, loot boxes, right? Yeah, then the, another question arises then, don't you think that that's the, like the psychological or emotional illness that every person has while growing up in their life? So that they can distract themselves from the real world to offensive world. For example, we see movies mm. in the same in the same reason, so that we can we can relate or be at a position or be at a time in such a way with the tech, with the high exponential growth of technology, so that we can just seem or be in a moment of a second or two seconds that we are not from this world and from other fantasy, and that we can just disregard this fantasy, this disregard this real world. Uh, my connection cut out a little bit. Um, I'm sorry. Could you could you restate the question? Yeah, my question is just that. Do you don't you think like the 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 psychological illnesses or the emotional mm. the disregards that we face while growing up in today's world, which is more complicated than the earlier centuries, that uh, people are intending more to play games or even to other media's which are fantasy, for example, Harry Potter or other Marvel series. Mm. Mm. That so that they can just disrelate or like discontinue mm. from the real life where there are so many problems and they know they have to be hard enough to solve them and if they don't have the capabilities and can't be in the race they they mm. won't be able to solve them. That's yeah. why they go towards this specification of being a game, let's say a game addiction mm. or mm. be too game addictive. Yeah. But in the other hand, if we see these problems, we can literally say that why are people doing this so that we can solve them in a psychological point of perspective? Mm. So um, I don't know that we have data that speak that speaks to it, but but I do think that there is. Um, it seems to me that it it might be the case that growing up today, you have so many choices and opportunities that uh, you know that. So the opportunities that I had. Um, my grandparents didn't have at all, right? I mean, access to education and like, do I want to be a professor, a professor in Denmark or go to the US or where do I, what do I want to do and how do I want to live my life? And I do think that there might be something to what you're saying that, that you know, escaping into a game or into Netflix or escaping into something else uh, might be a way to cope with the, uh, with exactly this problem of of having too too much freedom and the fact that the sky is the limit, right? If you grow up believing that that you could be the president of the United States, then anything less will be a disappointment, right? And uh, I guess for people who grew up without um, a lot of opportunities, it's it's easier to be it might be easier to be satisfied with what you have. Mm -hmm. My colleague Jan Cordes also posted a question in the talk. He's writing, thanks for the great talk. Are there examples of games helping with healing addictions? So maybe some positive aspects also. We've been talking quite a lot about negative aspects here, potential negative aspects. Yeah, are there games which help you heal certain addictions? Um, uh, I know there's a game in the US that's been um, approved by the FDA 
uh, the Food and Drug Administration as treatment for uh, ADHD, uh, attention hypocid, um yeah, um, I forget all, uh, all of the, the, the yeah. words that, that that's short for. Um, but so, no, th so this is something that's, that's super common as a diagnosis uh, in the Western world, at least. And there is a game that's, that's, that's cleared for, as a drug for that. Um, so I, I'm super interested to, I would be super interested to hear about people who felt addicted to video games and then were addicted or were really addicted to like heroin, right? And I found one, there's one author who has, you know, tried on the one hand to play games excessively and compulsively and been addicted to hardcore drugs. And according to him, it's it's nothing alike that, you know, the that games open up your world. If you play World of Warcraft or other MMOs, you know, they kind of expand your world, whereas drugs restrict your world. Um, and so the word so calling both of them addictions wouldn't really make sense because they're completely opposite experiences. Mm. Nicholas, you have a question. Yes, uh, I have a question. Hello there. Um, uh, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that the reason why the uh, World Health Organization uh, recognizes addiction is because many countries only offer the addiction support on the basis of the uh, World Health, Health Organization classification. There are people who claim to be video game addicted, but yeah. they do not get any support if the country does not, do not recognize this disease. Have you heard of it before or do you have any opinion yeah. about it? That's, it's a very common argument. A lot of people who uh, are proponents for the disorder are saying exactly that. Well, we need this disorder in order to get these people help because we can't get them help if in the system if they don't have uh, a, di a diagnosis. And uh, I think in, in a perfect world, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't uh, invent uh, diseases based on the best way to get help, but, you know, make the system fit the people and not the the people fit the system. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've, I've heard that a lot. It's, uh, it's, it's something that's put out there often. And, and I do think that, so based on my knowledge, at least of the clinics here in Denmark that treat people for video game addiction, what they do is not really related to video games. It's, it's sort of, it's standard, uh, cognitive therapy or, uh, um, yeah, it's 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 the theory, it's the, the the therapy that you would use um, for any other problem that's considered, you know, normal. Um, yeah, so something that's 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 really popular right now, at least over here, is ACT. Uh, it's uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, um, and I think that's what most of these video game addiction treatment centers they use. And so it could, it might as well be a regular psychologist because it's not really focused on the game. But are these people then, a follow-up question, and then Federico, are these people then claiming only to be game addicted or is it a bigger media problem for them? Um, well, I, on. I, think, I think game addiction becomes the thing you say to express how you're suffering, right? If you say you're a video game addict, then I think most people would no, would get a pretty good sense of the way that you are suffering at home. And that might be easier than explaining all of the complicated reasons that might be social, psychological, even biological uh, for why you are suffering and why you are playing video games. So I think it, it becomes what you say, um, just kind of like in uh, in, in the, the Western world, um, there used to be this disorder called neurasthenia or like bad nerves. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyone who has, and it was believed to be, you know, your nerves protruding from your brain into the body were kind of frayed or overexerted. And so everyone kind of knows what it is to have bad nerves, right? But there is no such thing as, as bad nerves. You know, you, your nerves don't get bad like that. It's not an it's not an organismic failure, it's psychological. At least that's how we see it now, right? Now we call those people depressed or suffering 
from anxiety or stressed or something else. We don't talk about bad nerves. Okay. And I think I think computer game addiction might be the 2021 uh, version of bad nerves, right? It's something that we can say so it conveys meaning. Okay. Hmm. Well then, Federico, you're up next. Thank you, Gerald. Um, I was wondering about the model you presented in the beginning about uh, random reward mechanisms, I think, with Pave, right? You made that. Uh, it was very neat, very good model. It was really cool. Um, and so you presented the fourth uh, sort of category there was gambling. Um, but I was thinking about that and, and about the definition of gambling, because I suppose you're, what you're saying is that that's a type of gambling, but there's more to gambling than just um, buying something without knowing what the reward's going to be, hoping that it's a great reward that you can then resell for more money. But I'm thinking like if I go and buy stock at the you know Wall Street or something, I know exactly what I'm buying. Uh, there's no random uh, reward there. What it, what it, what's random or what's unpredictable? At least, I don't know if this stock is going to to go up in price or down, right? No, yeah. So, would that count as gambling as well? In your definition, of what would be the definition of gambling? Does there need to be a certain immediacy to it that I I see what I bought and is oh I, I know it right away or like a slot machine I know right away if I won or lost. Mm. Um, so, what what role does time play there and or, Maybe you just have a, 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 you know, a definition of gambling in hand that you could share to, to clarify that. And if there are maybe because of that other forms of gambling in video games, that was maybe, you know, the main I, I, point of my question. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's an excellent question, and I'm thinking really fast and hard to try to come up with a good answer. Um, I think a lot of researchers would say that the stock market is gambling mm -hmm. because it's pretty clear that that nobody predictably beats the market, right? Uh, investing broadly is better than paying someone to try to figure out what's up and coming. Uh, but I think the the main reason is just that we perceive the stock market to be the real world and games to be games. I think that I think that's the reason. It's it's that we call it a game. Because I agree with you, tons of things in the world are provide random rewards and could be seen as, yeah. as gambling. It's the fact that we see this, this thing, and I don't want to get into what is a game and what's not a game, but we see this game, we, we see this thing, and we know when we see it, we think it's a game, and it has this random, it has no skill, and it has, it, it has monetary value, randomness, and unknown monetary value, right? That's why it's gambling. And, and so in, in Denmark, that's also at least why often prices will be something that you can't easily sell. So if you win like uh, a frozen turkey or a milkshake at McDonald's, then it's not gambling. And you can offer, you can have these random, um, you can have this randomness in the pro in the process, because a milkshake from McDonald's is so hard to sell. Uh, then it's not gambling because it's it doesn't put out money. Yeah. So I think it's it's the gameness. And the fact that we don't see uh, Wall Street as a game, though perhaps we we should, uh, especially given GameStop and Dogecoin and all that stuff, right? Yeah, it's also an important question with Bitcoin now and all this uh, NFT stuff that's going on. Uh, I mean, yeah, uh, I guess this is all connected somehow. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a fascinating world. Yeah. Scary, I think. Scary, <laughs> fascinating. They're very fascinating. Thanks for the answer. Before I ask of, uh, about any more questions, I have a question myself, maybe. <clears throat> uh, do you think within one game there are some forms of play which are could be more addictive, whereas other forms of play could be less addictive, or even if they're both addictive, some have positive effects, some have negative effects? The game I'm thinking about is Animal Crossing New Horizons. Um, if I'm building my island and then taking a stroll every night uh, into the sunset, this could be an addiction because I want to spend my nights in Animal Crossing and enjoy the sunset, but this calms me down. And then I start the turnip business, which is very hectic and which gives me into a lot of stress. Uh, so this is also very addictive, but addictive in a different form. So um, where do we draw the line here? And how how are people affected by the game? Because some 
might really like the turnip business. Um, whereas for me, it was stressful. So does it more depend on our predispositions? And now I, I'm I'm seeing it were like three questions. So yeah, I'm gonna shut. <laughs> So um, <clears throat> I do think that uh, there are problematic mechanics in video games and there are, you know, design patterns that that leads to people feeling addicted. But I, I think it, it's hard to say that, you know, I think it, it's so individual for every player what they like and dislike. So a lot of people are saying, for example, that grinding in World of Warcraft or grinding in the tulip business on your island, um, that that's you know uh, a dark design pattern. It's something that's you know that's mani manipulative and uh, exploits the player, makes the player behave in ways they don't want. Um, but for me personally, I mean that's what I like the grind. That's you know I like putting on and a podcast and just grinding away and just you know completely forgetting about uh, real life. And that's also what I like about exercise and sports. Um, I really like the grind um, mm -hmm. and having to, you know, having to to show up and invest all that energy in it. So um, so I think it is definitely possible to to define mechanics that make people stick around. Mm -hmm. But most of those mechanics, I would argue, are social mechanics. So the games that people are addicted to are the games with people in them. Um, most, so mo most, most people who, who have addictions uh, are playing games with other people inside. And, and then, then it's perhaps more about friendships and socializing and stuff like that but also about caring too much about something and wanting to care about something else. Mm. But then it's also, should we also distinguish then, of course, between immersion and addiction? Because addiction should have some negative effect on me. If I'm only immersed into Animal Crossing, that's good. But if I'm losing touch of real life, then this becomes an addiction, maybe. Mm. And, and I think that's the, that's, the, that's the problem with most of this research. So most of this, the research in this area is 10 questions you answer yes, no, maybe, and then you get points for how many yeses. Um, and I think what you're what you're saying is true that they're mostly measuring immersion, and mm -hmm. for a lot of people that immersion might have some might be correlated to negative things. Um, but in a lot of studies, um, you can't tell the addicts from the non-addicts because the addicts also have degrees from university. They also have jobs and stuff like that, right? And we would expect the addicts to have serious negative consequences, mm -hmm. and um, and and most times, you know, the the addicts are men and they're young, and they're recent recently graduated, and people who follow these people from for multiple years, like the Norwegian professor Felsen Carlson, finds that a lot of these people who are playing too much and might even say themselves that they're addicted, then they get a job or a girlfriend or become a parent or, you know, something. Um, and, and then they kind of drift out of this addiction. Okay. Uh, Michael is now also here. Does this, means we're, does this mean we're out of time? <laughs> no, no, but, uh, but maybe a, a, a last question because I don't see any more uh, questions in the chat. Maybe one last question from my side. Um, what do you think, uh, Rune, um, why did the, especially the Asia countries make so much pressure to the World uh, Health Organization? Mm. Why especially the Asia countries? Because they have so much problem with the young child and addiction and... Um, yeah, so um, it's a really, really interesting question. And I think there are very different explanations. Um, so South Korea, of course, is very different from China. Um, but um, in in South, so I had a, a visit from a South Korean journalist uh, who wanted to know, you know, how can it be that that Denmark has all these great esports athletes, and at the same time they don't have any video game addicts. So, but in in Korea it's different, right? And mm -hmm. and the the Korean educational system is so tough that you have a lot of cases of. Uh, 
of researchers actually conducting fraud because they're putting their the names of their children on their research papers so they can get into a good university or a good even a good high school that leads to a good university uh, because it's so competitive and they have these cram schools where they study for the exams um, and they don't have a lot of free time so in those countries spending even like half an hour playing video games every day would be detrimental because you're losing sleep um, so I, I think in a country like south korea it's very much about all the pressures and all the work that's put on young people um, in a country like China, I think it's also historical. It's also, it, so I talked to uh, some Chinese game scholars who said that Confucianism um, and Confucius had this idea that playing games is, you know, is unserious and not something that you should waste your time doing. And then of course, China has a horrible history with Japan. And then, you know, Japan is the country that comes up with a lot of these video games mm. and it, it kind of feels to perhaps to the Chinese as cultural imperialism, right? You know, they they invaded our country once, now they're invading again with these products. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, the, in China, there's the whole thing about it being a dictatorship where there's no free speech and uh, and and video games are of course places where people meet up and talk and um, and have fun and can speak freely. Mm. And finally, um, something that uh, that I've seen in a documentary, I haven't seen research on this, but ever since they went away from the one child policy, every parent only has one kid and that kid has to um, support their parents when their parents are old. So it's this one kid that needs to have uh, success in life mm. and compete in Chinese universities. So you have to force them to study, 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 uh, because they need a good education. They need a good job. They need to be able to take care of you when you're old and you only have that one kid, right? And that perhaps is leading to, um, feelings of isolation and loneliness because there's no siblings at home and all you do is do homework. Uh, but this is now I'm, I'm really speculating. This is not mm. so research as speculation. Okay, thank you very much, Rune. Thank you very much.